Okay, everybody. Hello again. Uh, it's good to be with you guys. As always, I hope you've been doing really great since you last attended one of these virtual uh, lessons. So um, we have another important meeting now. The, chat, the class continues as we mark the transition to another major world religious tradition. So um, just a little bit of review. As you guys all know, so far in the class, we've reviewed six major subjects. Uh, we started with Judaism, and then it was Christianity, then the religious tradition of Islam, Hinduism, number five with Buddhism, and then we just wrapped up the discussion and summary of the Chinese religious traditions. Uh, you know, the main three teachings being Confucianism, Taoism, and Chinese Buddhism, together with the uh, Chinese popular religion that kind of pervades and uh, adds unifying themes to all the others. Um, today, we begin with our final major world religious tradition um, in the class, which is the Japanese traditions. So that's our focus now. Japanese traditions. Uh, Japanese religious traditions. So, um, as before, as we've done with all the other course subjects, we will have a three part lecture series on this topic, and today is just installment number one. After this uh, unit on the Japanese religious traditions wraps up, um, we will send, we'll spend just a few lectures reviewing philosophical arguments that have been created throughout history, which try to give a proof that God exists. And we'll also study uh, briefly some objections and replies and criticisms to those different arguments. Um, just an update on the um, second essay assignment. I mean, nothing has changed, but I just want to remind you not to forget that next week, um, Thursday, May the 4th, that'll be the due date for your second essay, and you'll just send it to me as you did with the previous uh, essay any time before. Uh, sorry. <coughs> Eddie making me sneeze. Uh, before 11.59 p.m. next Thursday, May the 4th. Um, anybody who is seeking any assistance of any type or information on anything at all is please encouraged to reach out to me at any time and I'm happy to help. I'm always happy to help any student in any way that I can. So just reach out if you need me and I'm always available. Please also just don't forget to submit those journal entries. Uh, some students seem to have, you know, done pretty well submitting them. Others seem to have basically ignored that. But look, there's still time to turn some of them in. Um, it's an easy way to help your grade because they're very easy with the grading. Um, I'm giving out people pretty much A's, you know, A minuses for, for almost anything that they submit. So, um, you know, it's up to you, you do you, but if you want to help your grade and boost your score a little bit, you can obviously turn those in. And um, a journal entry is not something that's like very hard to do and it's not very difficult with the grading in terms of how much scrutiny that I apply to it. It's not like um, the same as a test or an essay, which is certainly a little bit more uh, criticism and um, commentary that I apply to the evaluation of it. But anyway, that's just some things to keep us uh, all in track with the class. Now that we've talked about that, let's just begin with the launch of our new course topic, the religious traditions of Japan. So Japan in the modern era has an immense global influence, just its culture, um, and it has a population of around 125 million people. So those two factors uh, help to justify its inclusion in Coogan's book and in our course. Um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, as we start this le lesson is that an interesting aspect of the study of the different world religions, uh, including this one, is that it serves the dual purpose of being both the study of the religious traditions and doctrines themselves, but also an anthropological study of the history and culture of various civilizations and regions of the world. So as such, we've learned about religions, but also about the histories, culture, and geographies of a variety of different civilizations around the world. For example, in learning about Islam, we learned about also the history of the Middle East and of Arab cultures. In learning about Hinduism, we learn about the history and culture of the Indian subcontinent. In learning the Chinese traditions, we also learn about the history and culture of China. And the same is true of our new topic. We will learn about the Japanese religious traditions, and by doing that, we'll also gain some insight into the history and culture of Japan itself. Um, We've also now learned about the major traditions that cover the majority of the whole human global population. So if you just do the math, you know, there's about 2 billion Christians, close to 2 billion Muslims today, over 1.2 billion Hindus. Uh, the population of China is well over 1.4 billion. 
And there are about 18 million Jews and the population of Japan is 125 million. So if you just add all those different factors together, the adherence of these various religious traditions that we have studied together form uh, over six and a half billion of the planet's population. The planet's population currently is estimated to be somewhere around 8 billion people. So that is over 80% of the whole total human population. So, I mean, that's another reason the class is interesting and it's very informative uh, because we're learning about the collected traditions developed in diverse world cultures across history, which gives us a better sense of what beliefs, customs, and values compose our complex interrelated human world. So we're learning about human beings and human societies and history. And, um, you know, again, the majority of people in the world subscribe to one or another of these different faiths. So it gives you, I think, a better ability to uh, see across divides, uh, to see where we all have similarities, where there are some differences, and to just inform yourself about the, um, the rich tapestry of uh, tradition, doctrine, and belief, and history that we find when we look at various global communities. So anyway then, today begins our review of the Japanese traditions. We'll focus um, on these units of discussion today. First, we'll have a general introduction to the Japanese tra traditions. Um, sorry for the little beep sound, it's just my washing machine over there uh, with its in, uh, you know, indication that it's ready. Anyway though, uh, so we'll start off with an introduction to the Japanese traditions, then we'll do a deeper dive into the origins and historical development of those traditions. And then um, we're going to take a, a moment to look at some of the aspects of the divine that we find also uh, in Japanese beliefs and doctrines. Um, since there's so many notes on this material, I'm going to get through about half of the aspects of the divine, pretty much talk to you about the Shinto uh, aspects of the divine, and then we will get to the, um, the Buddhist aspects as we begin the next meeting and continue from there. So anyways, then we're ready for launch. Let's get right into the first thing, which is a general introduction to the Japanese religious traditions. So there are two major traditions that people in Japan practice, and usually they practice both of them simultaneously. So the two main traditions are Shinto uh, and Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism. Okay, so with our introduction beginning now, <clears throat> just gonna create a heading for that. Two main traditions in Japan. So the first, the Shinto tradition. Sorry, let me strike that because I put a little typo in it. <clears throat> the first, Shinto, <clears throat> and then the second, Buddhism. Um, so uh, the indigenous Japanese natural national religion, I should say, is known as Shinto. Um, so that religion has existed in Japan since uh, well before Buddhism arrived. Um, it has roots that trace back to before the common era. Um, and so Shinto is the nat national religion that is indigenous to Japan that started in Japan. Uh, and Japanese Buddhism takes Buddhism, which of course originates um, in India and then spread to Southeast Asia and China and then from China to Korea and through Korea to Japan. Um, Buddhism found its way to Japan by spreading from China to Korea, then from Korea to Japan in the mid sixth century ACE. So Shinto originates in Japan, Buddhism, migrates to Japan by way of uh, intermediary countries. It starts in India, it is, uh, migrates to China by uh, missionaries and uh, travelers that are going on tra trade routes. And then from China, it really kind of flourishes and spreads further um, to either Southeast Asia, Korea, and eventually Japan. Now, Japan um, in the mid sixth century ACE, when Buddhism first arrived there, it was a mostly illiterate country, so most people could not uh, read or write. Um, so in addition to ushering in a new religious worldview, Buddhism also brought literacy to Japan. That is because Buddhist scriptures could only be read in Chinese at the time. So some people in the aristocracy and in the nobility classes of society in Japan converted to Buddhism, and they would like to know how to read and write 
the Buddhist scriptures. So they taught themselves how to read and write those Chinese characters. And then that becomes the basis for the um, written script that turns into the Japanese written form of language. So there was really no written form of Japanese prior to uh, the introduction of Buddhism from China and Korea to Japan. So that's a notable fact about the uh, religious interaction between these different cultures, but also the flourishing of knowledge and, um, and, uh, and learning. You know, literacy came to Japan again from Buddhist scriptures that were translated um, and people then learned how to write the Chinese characters. The literacy uh, started then with the kind of elite group of people that were in the aristocracy and in the nobility. Um, but their literacy expanded throughout that cohort and then it eventually trickled out to the broader population. But again, it all began with the desire to read and discuss Buddhist scriptures. Um, as such, the Japanese written language and writing system is heavily influenced by Chinese and it shares many common characters with it in the written inscriptions. Despite their similarities of written form, uh, the languages of Chinese and Japanese are significantly different phonetically in the way that they're spoken and the way that they're articulated, uh, the way that they sound. So uh, there's this influence in terms of the written inscriptions, but there's differences in speech. The characters are the thing that are mutually recognizable between Chinese and Japanese text, not the pronunciations and so on. <clears throat> so back to Shinto though. The indigenous religion of Japan is known as Shinto and uh, the word Shinto is a Japanese rendition of two Chinese words, Shen meaning spirit. So, and Dao, which now we all know means way. So those things come together into the Japanese term of Shinto, which basically means a uh, way of the gods or spirits. There we go. So Shinto, way of the gods or slash spirits. Um, the word is written in, with the Chinese characters for Shen and Dao. And Shinto has existed for a long time. It dates back to Japanese prehistory. Uh, the time before the sixth century of the common era is the prehistoric Japanese time period. Modern uh, history of Japan kind of starts to track at around sixth century ACE. So Shinto is from a considerably uh, uh, previous time period than the 6th century ACE. The most central concept and idea of Shinto is the idea of Kami. So this is the big most basic concept that really animates the whole religious view of Shintoism. It's Kami, which means um, so divine being um, is, is one way to translate it or spirit. So I'll just put a few Sorry, I mistyped the word spirit, so I'm just going to write that one more time, if you don't mind. Sorry, thank you, guys. Okay, Kami, again. It's a spirit, or you could say divine being, um, or even just god or goddess. The concept of a Kami uh, remains at the forefront of Japanese religious thought today. Kami are sort of like, you could say, ghosts uh, or divine spirit entities, but they're said to be uh, not just of people. They can be of people, they can be of gods, they can even be of places or time periods or objects can even have them. Uh, to be Shinto is thus to see yourself as living in a world infused with these spirits all around, all the time, and to act in accordance with what respects and shows honor to them. Um, now, the Chinese traditions of Confucianism and Taoism have also had some influence in shaping the Japanese, Buddhist, and Shinto traditions, but they never really attained the status of true religious sects in Japan, unlike their more prominent role in Chinese culture. China has had a large impact on Japan, um, the religious influence, art, and philosophy. But nonetheless, Japan has always maintained its own unique culture distinct from China. Um, in cases where it has borrowed from Chinese traditions, it's transformed and adapted them to make them distinctively Japanese. So, for example, the Mahayana Buddhist sects that came to Japan uh, turned into the uniquely Japanese uh, schools of Buddhism, which are called the Nara schools. 
So here are the Japanese Buddhist schools that kind of became distinctively Japanese after having traveled there from their original Chinese origins. <clears throat> So the Nara schools of Japanese Buddhism separate into these uh, Tendai, Chingon, <clears throat> Jodoshu, <clears throat> Jodo Shinshu, um, Nichiren Shu, and Nichiren Shinshu, Shoshu, I meant to say. <clears throat> okay, and oh, well, one more actually, Zen. Hmm. Zen, the uh, Japanese version of Chan Buddhism from. Uh, it's, it's Chinese original. In Japan over time, the line between Buddhism and Shinto has definitely become somewhat blurred. Many Buddhist deities have come to be seen as Shinto kami and vice versa. So like we've learned about uh, celestial Buddhas and bodhisattvas that are uh, a feature and a staple of the Mahayana brand of uh, Buddhist tradition. And some of those same kind of semi-divine Buddha figures are also now kind of integrated with Japanese kami and vice versa. Sometimes uh, kami are appropriated within the Buddhist hierarchy of uh, bodhisattvas also. So this reflects again, a cultural preference for synthesis and fusion of different belief systems and practices into one. That's a cultural preference that the Japanese share with the Chinese who, as we've learned, also have often simultaneously uh, people following all of the three teachings. And in some cases, even seeing them as one hybrid system that's all integrated together. In Japan, we also see that same tolerance for ambiguity. And so accordingly, most Japanese consider themselves to be both Shinto and Buddhist. Some characterize Shinto as the life religion and Buddhism as the death religion. So this is one way to see the different emphases that they each have. Um, Now, I don't mean that to somehow carry like a positive or negative connotation like Shinto because it's associated with life means that it's positive and nice and Buddhism because about death is dark and bad. No, instead they just reflect different uh, aspects of what we are using them to, um, to relate to or to understand in religious practice. So Shinto focuses more on worldly matters, things that uh, happen in this life, such as fertility, procreation, good health, physical well-being financial and family prosperity. Buddhism, on the other hand, although it also cares about the things happening in this life and in this world, has a greater emphasis on the ability to be saved from the perpetual cycle of samsara, reincarnation. And as such, it has more of a focus on the disposition of your soul in the afterlife and your karmic balance. And so because there's these different emphasis, some say that Shinto focuses more on the terrestrial and life-born aspects of our existence where Buddhism focuses on the ultimate condition of our immortal soul after death. Because of those differences, most Japanese weddings are held according to Shinto traditions. So weddings have to do with life and our current existence as a family. And most funerals are Buddhist and cemeteries are attached to Buddhist temples, which shows the kind of concern with the ultimate outcome of the soul and its reincarnation after death as seen in Buddhist tradition. So, it's interesting, therefore, to see that they can kind of form two complementary halves of one overall religious practice. When you're focused on the events of your life and your daily affairs, you might turn to the Shinto practice to gain some sense of guidance and inspiration. If you're more focused on um, salvation of your soul and escaping the burdens of reincarnation, then you look to the Buddhist tradition, so life and death. As so a pervasive theme in Japanese culture that influences their perspective on religion is the value and belief that the individual is less important than the group. The subordination of the individual to the group, it's an important value that's really uh, emphasized throughout Japanese thought, culturally, not just in the religion. 
So our book helps to explain this by reference to the Japanese expression, the nail that sticks up will be hammered down. So here's just a little phrase that is sometimes found in Japanese uh, tradition. Uh, the nail that sticks up, make sure I wrote it right instead of it doesn't say sticks out. Yeah, the nail that sticks up will be hammered down. So I know we all value our individuality and our ability to be a unique person separate from the crowd, you know, but um, one theme that really is sort of central to Japanese thought is this priority around seeing how you're part of something bigger than yourself. And that bigger thing matters more than just you as an individual. So if you stick up as this one like rogue nail, you know, so all the other nails are hammered down and there's one that's um, sort of popping out, calling greater attention to itself, distinguishing itself from all the others then that nail, because it sticks up, can be hammered down and brought back uh, on par with all of its, you know, um, brethren. Um, so it's a metaphor for how, you know, individualism can sometimes be toxic. There's an ethic of collective decision-making for the benefit of the group. This is reflected in the character of Shinto and Japanese Buddhism, which emphasize social cooperation and an absence of toxic individualism. I know there's a saying sometimes people hold nowadays that, you know, you've got this main character energy. It's all about you. But according to this way of looking at the world and life, you're not the main character, nor is any single person. We're all uh, bit players in a much larger production. And the, for, the, the sort of main uh, uh, emphasis of the story is our collective lives together rather than our individual um, existences. So you see yourself according to this ethic and value as part of a bigger social unit. What could this bigger social unit be? The family, the village, the nation, or even maybe just the company or business that you work for. It's the well-being of that larger social unit that has the most importance um, to this idea of collective uh, value as holds more uh, weight than the individual. Some scholars say that this collectivist ethic developed in part by the requirements needed for um, wet rice cultivation. So you might wonder, well, what is the thing that has sort of generated this cultural orientation towards collectivist thinking and the priority that that holds in that society and culture? Well, part of it can be traced historically to the, uh, the origins and roots coming from how people worked cooperatively to cultivate wet rice paddies. So rice paddies were first introduced to Japan in the millennium before the common era. And before there were industrial or mechanized processes to do this, uh, it was a very labor intensive process to generate these rice paddies, which of course became a staple of um, the diet. So each rice plant would have to be hand inserted into the wet ground. And therefore people would have to work together to plant, weed and harvest for the good of their village or for the good of their community. And that instilled this value of working together for a larger goal that benefits all of us instead of just for the you know, uh, maximization of one's own benefit. So now I've given you guys this basic general introduction to the Japanese traditions. So at this time, we're going to turn our attention and focus more specifically to the origins and historical development of the traditions in greater depth. So Shinto has ancient historical roots in Japan. The earliest prehistoric era of Japan is called the Jomon era, which, sp which spans from 11,000 to 300 BCE. So that's quite a long period. But it's the first one spoken of in um, Japanese cultural and historical traditions. So the Jamon era, again, 11,000 BC, so long ago, 11,000 years before the Common Era, all the way up until 300 BCE. Okay, so we start at the beginning with this earliest prehistoric era of Japan. People living in the Japanese archipelago at that time, so archipelago is just a term that means, you know, a series of islands joined into one uh, kind of unity or community. So the Japanese archipelago, people living in that at that time during the Jaman era, um, seemed to practice some kind of primordial religion based around a primitive fertility cult of some type. This is known because of relics that have been recovered and uh, excavated by archaeologists which show these statues of female shaped figures, which are called dogu. Okay, so.
Pixo says just in little type notes, Dogu are prehistoric female-shaped statues from the Jaman era. Um, these Dogu give some evidence of a type of primitive fertility cult because often they have emphasized the hips and breasts of these female statue statuesque figures or figurines. Um, that sort of indicates the maternal and childbearing role of the woman. So there's thought to be some kind of spiritual association between fertility and these statues. Uh, detailed information as to the meaning of these statues is not 100% clear because much of that's been lost to history, but many of them were found near graves, and it seemed that they were deliberately broken uh, prior to being placed near the grave. So some, some historians and scholars have uh, interpreted that to mean that it suggests a ritual of releasing the spirit of the dogu um, at death. But whether the spirit is anything comparable to the later Shinto idea of kami, somewhat speculative. Um, the next prehistoric period of Japan that follows after the earliest uh, Jaman era is the Yayoi era. And the Yayoi era spans uh, about 600 years, from 300 BCE to 300 ACE. The Yayoi era, next up in line in the historical timeline. The Yayoi culture uh, was actually a civilization of rice cultivators who arrived in Japan from uh, China or Southeast Asia. And um, their culture was a little more sophisticated and advanced than the Joman era's culture was. During the Yayoi era, we start to see historical um, evidence of more Shintoistic icons and relics. Images of grain storehouses have been found uh, from this time period, and those are similar to the shrine of Issei, which is the holiest site in the Shinto religion. We'll talk more about that when we get to sacred places in one of our next lectures coming up. But anyway, the fact that these uh, you know, icons and images of the grain storehouses have been found that are sort of from that time period makes it seem as if there may have been some kind of um, idea of a divine spirit essence to the cultivation of rice, which later becomes a specific uh, Shinto deity. Uh, female fertility images and phallic symbols and relics have also been found as well in the Yayoi era, and that's evidence uh, of rituals related to sowing and harvesting rice, similar to the rice-related Shinto rituals that continue until this day in Japanese villages. Other relics of the Yayoi era include kama-shaped jewels, which are called magatama. So here are some other relics and uh, Things have been recovered from that era. Magatama, they are comic shaped. <clears throat> um, jewels. <clears throat> from the Yayoi era. <clears throat> yeah, so these have been found as well as ceremonial mirrors and sacred swords. Um, these things, the Magatama, ceremonial mirrors and sacred swords, they still play an important role in Shinto mythology and they still are an important part of the regalia that is sometimes worn by Shinto priests. Um, most of the deities associated with ancient Japanese clans date from this period as well. The ancient clans of, you know, Japan are called Uji, so here's that term. Okay, so the ancient ruling clans of Japan were called Uji, and um, the deities that are associated with these ancient clans are called Ujigami. So Uji are the clans themselves, and the deities that are sometimes associated with or related to them are the Ujigami. Um, the Japanese imperial family, that's the Japanese royal family, you know, with the uh, lineage of emperors going back into the past, is the uh, Yamato Uji, which means Sun Clan. So,
think so. Just one of the most prominent and uh, the most prominent of the Uji referred to is the Yamato Uji, and that's the Sun Clan, the term used to refer to the clan of the Japanese royal family. Um, there's a mythical progenitor of this clan, according to Shinto uh, text and tradition, and that's Amaterasu. Okay, so the sun goddess of the Yamato Uji is um, Amaterasu, and uh, we'll say more about her in uh, further sections of this lecture, but she is and has been the most important Ujigami in the whole Shinto tradition. She's considered to be the mythical progenitor of, um, of the whole imperial line. Now, the Yayoi era ends around the 4th century ACE, uh, when a group of horse riding nomads from Central Asia conquered Japan. And um, with this, we begin to see a new structure known as the Kofun. So, Kofun is a massive keyhole shaped mound, um, which is created as a tomb for an important chief of a clan. I'm going to try to show you one such image if I can. I'm not sure if it'll be very big on my phone, but we'll see. Um, so I'm looking at the camera. Yeah, you can kind of see that this giant keyhole shaped structure and you see like there's a lot of like, you know, urban dwelling spaces around. So this is very big, you know, it's bigger than houses and all the rest. Um, those now start to appear in the next era that follows after the Yayoi period. Um, and they are supposed to be these um, burial sites for chieftains and uh, warlords that attained power. So they're created as a tomb for an important chief of a clan. Surrounding the Kofun would often be statues and figurines of horses or warriors, which they also have a name for, and that's Haniwa. So Kofun, definition for that first. A kofun, massive keyhole shaped mounds created as tombs for important chiefs of clans and encircling a lot of these um, and within and around them you'd find the Haniwa. And the Haniwa just refers to these um, statues and figures of horses or warriors. <clears throat> So these are statues and figures, horses, warriors, etc. They would surround the Kofun, these big tomb, uh, keyhole-shaped tombs and burial sites of chiefs. Um, and the Haniwa were placed there because it was believed that they would journey with the warlord or the chief to the afterlife. So to provide them with a sort of, um, you know, host that will accompany them along their, their journey from the earthly realm to the afterlife. In the early 6th century ACE, in the south and west of Japan, uh, in that region, we begin to see the first Buddhist missionaries arriving around 550 ACE. And the king of a southwest Korean region who had converted to Buddhism drove this expansion by sending missionaries up to Japan. Um, many people in this uh, were quick to embrace Buddhism. So this region that the Buddhists were arriving in was sometimes called the Yamato region. So the Yamato region is the southwest region of Japan where Buddhist missionaries first arrived in the mid-6th century ACE, around 550 ACE. 
Um, they were sent there again by the king of a southwest Korean region who converted himself to Buddhism and then wanted to drive the expansion further by sending missionaries to Japan. Many people in that region were quick to embrace Buddhism, but they did so in a way that fused it with certain elements of Shinto belief. For example, seeing statues of Buddha as powerful kami. Um, others didn't necessarily embrace it, at least not at first, because some people thought that it was an intrusion from outside into authentic Japanese culture. So there have been some tensions, and later in history we'll see that play out again. Um, in 592, there was a guy named Prince Shotoku, and he, was decla he declared Buddhism the official religion of the emperor's family, and so the imperial court. So this is an important man's name to know about, Prince Shotoku. I'll tell you a little bit more about him, but basically let's get the dates of his life. Um, he was born in 574 ACE, and he lived until uh, 622, yeah, until 622 ACE, same year that he drove in a different part of the world. <clears throat> So about Prince Shotoku, um, again, he's an important figure in the expansion and development of Buddhism in Japan because um, he's the guy who in 592 declared it the official religion of the emperor's court. So Now, um, Shotoku goes by a label known as a regent. I'm writing the word here, R-E-G-E-N-T. He's a regent, and uh, here's what we mean by that. So a regent is a person who's given the authority to oversee matters for either a king or emperor that is too young or an empress, like a female um, head of state that would like to have a male um, source of guidance and uh, authority. So he was born a prince in 574 ACE to the Emperor Yomei, um, so Shotoku's father. In Yomei, he presided over a certain region of Japan, not the entire country, but just a part. Um, his father was one of the first people in power to embrace the, to them, new religion of Buddhism, and he exposed Shotoku to it at a very young age. Um, so then he becomes a regent. He works very hard to expand Buddhism, founding many temples. By the way, I, I should have mentioned this, but he became a regent of the empress at the time. Um, so she appointed him. That's his aunt, actually. Um, and then he becomes kind of a functioning head of state under her uh, official designation of authority. So throughout his reign as regent, he would work hard to expand Buddhism. He founded many of the original Japanese Buddhist temples, and that's why he sometimes is regarded historically as the founder of Japanese Buddhism. Um, he also studied the Chinese classics, and he introduced some Confucian and Taoist ideas to Japan also. Um, but his legacy is that when he died in 622, um, during his lifetime, J Japan transformed from a non-literate proto-state into a civilized and advanced empire modeled uh, largely on China. So for the two centuries that followed his life, that is like after 622 up until we get around to the 800s ACE, Buddhism rapidly expands among the aristoc uh, aristocratic class of nobles. But it's not until the next um, major historical era called the Heian era. Now let me tell you the name of that and the dates. <clears throat> So the Heian era in Japan goes from 794 A.C.E. until 1185. Um, <clears throat> so again, like I said, for two centuries following the life of uh, Prince Shotoku, Buddhism expands broadly among the aristocratic class, but it's not until uh, that era, the Heian era, that it starts to gain a bigger following among the general population and not just elites and aristocrats. In 806 ACE, monks uh, returning from travels to China 
founded two new Buddhist sects derived from Chinese views. So there's these two important monks, Kobo Daishi um, and um, make sure I don't misspell the other person's name. Yeah. Hey, so cute. Dengyo Daishi, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, so these are just um, two Buddhist monks that returned from travels to China. Daishi, Dengyo Daishi, two Buddhist monks. They both traveled to China and then they returned to Japan, um, at which time they founded these two sects of China, uh, sorry, of Japanese Buddhism, Shingon and Tendai. And they returned in uh, 806 ACE. So that's giving you that date. Yeah. Um, so their work to try and establish these two new sects of uh, Japanese Buddhism, having completed their, you know, journeys and adventures in China, that kind of helps to start spreading this more, more beyond just the nobles and aristocrats and out into the general population of lay people. Um, both have their main temples. So Shingon and Tendai both had temples on mountains in, in Kyoto, a major city in Japan. Shingon had its major temple on Mount Koya. So... Mount Koya is where the main temple of Shingon Buddhism is, and the main temple for Tendai is on Mount Hai. Okay, just need some of the geographic facts there. Um, from these mountain regions, missionaries would then fan out into the countryside around it, and that would help facilitate the rapid conversion of a lot of different people to Buddhism through both the 9th and 10th centuries ACE. Zen sects of Japanese Buddhism start to appear also in about the 12th and 13th centuries, and they also form a base in the city of Kyoto. Buddhists did not try, in Japan, they did not try to undermine or replace Shinto. Instead, they built shrines next to Shinto shrines, and they would build temples nearby to Shinto temples, and they just declare that there is really no conflict between the two, but rather that they can be merged into one. Toward the end of the Heian era, this attitude of harmony between them led to the creation of a new form of Shinto, which was called Ryobu Shinto. <clears throat> so in an effort to kind of further fuse these two disparate strands of thought or overlapping strands of thought, I guess, into one, we see the advent of uh, Ryobu Shinto, which means double Shinto. And that is when Shinto Kami and Buddhist uh, Bodhisattvas are fused into single divine beings. So they just kind of integrate the lineage of celestial Bodhisattvas into the realm of the pantheon of Kami. Um, in, Jap in Japanese, by the way, the word for Bodhisattva is Bosatsu. So that's something I think I'll mention for you now. Okay, so those enlightened um, celestial bodhisattvas are just called by the Japanese term bosatsu. And as you remember, those are uh, Buddhas that have achieved enlightenment, but they stop from entering nirvana so that they can continue to grace people and to try and help them along their path to enlightenment. Um, and in Ryobo Shinto, uh, 
in the artwork of that type of uh, religious tradition, they sometimes depict the uh, fusion of kami and bosatsu by showing artistic renderings of kami dreaming of their bosatsu incarnations to kind of show this link between the two. Um, the kami is dreaming of their incarnation as a bosatsu, showing the sort of interconnectedness of both and the sort of um, the equivalence of both. At the end of this high end era, um, you know, that's getting close to the 12th century ACE, 13th century ACE. Um, at the end of the high end era, there's unfortunately a brutal civil war in Japan. And after that, for four centuries, there's a period of internal conflict and tension. Uh, part of the next period is the Kamakura era, which spans from 1185 to 1333 ACE, of course. So I'm putting those dates and getting a name. Kamakura era, 1185 to 1333. Um, in response to the social challenges of the uh, of the time, three Buddhist sects arose in the Kamakura era. So you know there was this social challenges brought about by the tensions of internal strife that were initially uh, derived from civil war and conflict. So to kind of deal with some of those tensions, there were different strands of Buddhist thought that arose during that era, which are these three. Uh, Jodo Shu, which means pure land. So we've talked a little bit about pure land Buddhism, but we'll talk more about it again. So Jodo Shu is the Japanese term for pure land Buddhism. So I'm just saying here. Uh, I guess I put one of them in there. It says three new Japanese Buddhist sects arise in the Kamakura era. One is Jodo Shu, which means Pure Land Buddhism. Uh, the next is Jodo Shinshu, and that just refers to um, True Pure Land. True Pure Land Buddhism, and um, Nishiren Shu. <clears throat> which just refers to um, Nichiren Buddhism. By the way, um, the word Shu just means um, sect. So if you're saying Jodo, shu, Jodo uh, Shin Shu, sorry, I, I have one slight typo there without the letter N. I just caught that, so I'm going to fix that for you. <clears throat> Okay, so anyway, Jodo Shinshu. Uh, so the three are Jodo Shu, Jodo Shinshu, and Nichiren Shu. And um, Shu again means sect. So in referring to Jodo Shu, this is the uh, Jodo sect. Jodo Shinshu, Jodo Shin sect. Nichiren Shu, Nichiren sect. The three founders of these schools all studied at the Buddhist temple complex on Mount Hai. And uh, let's say who these founders were. One was Honen who lived from 1133 to 1212 ACE. And he's founder of <clears throat> uh, the Pure Land. Then we have um, Shinran. His life goes from 1173 to 1263. Uh, he's the founder of True Pure Land. Finally, we have Nichiren, the eponymous, meaning self-named founder of the Nichiren School, and he lives from 1222 until 1282.
are just the names of these important figures. We'll learn more about each of them in the next lesson when we talk about sacred persons, but I at least wanted to sort of refer to them because they're also double mentioned in the origins and historical development of Japanese traditions since they had such a sizable role in the uh, development of Japanese Buddhism. Um, so the next two eras that follow after are the Ashikaga era. And that spans from 1333 to 1568 ACE. And then we do have a, a Momoyama era. <clears throat> which goes from 1568 to 1603. Again, these are all dates ACE, we're well beyond the, before the common era, so we're into the common era now. Late in the Ashikaga era, Christianity arrives in Japan in 1549, but it really didn't catch on very widely. Um, an early advocate of Christianity in Japan was Oda Nobunaga. He lived from 1534 to 1582. Uh, so he was like um, a convert to Christianity, or at least somebody who found great interest in it. And he tried to promote it more broadly to Japanese population. But, uh, you know, he had limited success. He actually ended up becoming assassinated. And the general who succeeded him persecuted Japanese Christians, um, expelling missionaries from Japan, crucifying believers, and eventually just banning the religion outright in the year 1596. So due to this and other subsequent periods of persecution, as well as just general cultural differences of Japan, uh, Christianity never really did gain a big following in Japan. Today, in a country with a population of over 125 million, there are fewer than 600,000 Christians, so that's less than half of 1% of the population. Um, so as we move on from the Momoyama era, uh, the next time period that's important is the Tokugawa era from 1603 to 1868. Tokugawa era, uh, 1603 to 1868. During that phase, Buddhism is on the rise and it's gaining more strength. Um, Confucian uh, social hierarchy ideas were also sort of having an influence during that time. For example, the only Confucian temple in all of Tokyo uh, was built during this time period, during 1690. Um, the next era, now we're getting into much shorter time scales because we're getting closer to the modern day, but some speak of the Meiji era. And that lasts from uh, 1868 to 1912. to 1912. Um, right, so that's the Meiji area, and it's called that uh, because at this time imperial power is restored under Emperor Meiji, um, and there's a revival of the Shinto religion. Um, Shinto then becomes the official religion of Japan, and there's a brief backlash against Buddhism as a foreign faith. Uh, there's some discussion of that here on page 245, so let me read. You know, the reason that Shinto is so popular during a time where the imperial court is in ascendancy is because it has this sophisticated origin story of the Japanese archipelago that sort of uh, links current day heads of state like emperors with the ancient um, gods that were said to have created the world and created Japan. So um, emperors trying to derive ultimate authority for their rule and ultimate legitimacy for their rule would like to be seen as continuous with the legendary and mythical gods of the prehistoric period. So um, so that's why, you know, when an emperor takes the reins and they kind of uh, took power away from the shogunate, which was a more diverse body of uh, political authority and not invested in only a central authority. When emperors become the central authority, they'd like to justify their rule. So this helps to explain why Shinto comes back into um, power and ascendancy during the Meiji era. But anyway, on page 245, I was gonna read you a little quote that describes um, some of the backlash to Buddhism during these later Shinto revival periods. As it says here, 
The triumph of Shinto after the Meiji Restoration resulted in a backlash against Buddhism, which was long favored by the shogunate. Long-standing Buddhist symbols and practices were forcibly removed from major shrines by the new imperialist regime. And in the 1870s, the Buddhist clergy dramatically lost the influence it had enjoyed under the Tokugawa. Museums and collectors in Europe and America provided a ready market for priceless artifacts looted from temples by anti-Buddhist zealots, with the authorities often turning a blind eye. However, in the late 1880s, the imperial government put an end to the backlash, and the Buddhist establishment made a rapid comeback. Shinto remained the state religion until 1945, when, of course, you know, um, atomic bombs were used to, to stop um, the Japanese uh, alliance with the Axis powers um, as we were fighting World War II. But anyway, that's when the state religion was no longer Shinto, uh, but the historic balance between the two faiths was restored and persists to the present. State Shinto was disestablished after the end of the Second World War. You know, after the trauma of the nuclear blasts, um, there was a big dis discussion in Japanese culture about um, becoming less militarized and less willing to follow the emperor to, uh, you know, the possible path of destruction, uh, con having military conflicts with nuclear armed powers like the United States. So it caused, a, it forced a reevaluation of uh, the value and emphasis that there had been on imperial power up till that time. That's why 1945 is a notable date in that uh, little passage we just read. Okay, so, um, yeah, there's a Shinto revival under the Meiji era. It becomes the official religion of Japan. There's a brief backlash against Buddhism as a foreign faith. So now we've taken a good look at the origins and historical development of the Japanese traditions. And so I just want to finish this little lesson by spending some time discussing the aspects of the divine that we found in the Shinto religion. We're going to talk also about aspects of the divine to start our next meeting. Uh, and that is sort of right around our page 248 or 9 of the textbook when it starts to talk about the Buddhist aspects of the divine that are important to Japanese uh, interpretations of Buddhism. But anyway, for now, we're looking at the Shinto aspects of the divine in the Japanese tradition. So as I said before, the concept of kami is the single most important notion in the whole Shinto religion. Some translate kami as deity, like a god or goddess, but again, the, the term really can stand for a very, very wide range of spirit beings and spirit essences. In one of the primary sacred texts of Shinto known as the Kojiki, so we'll talk about this next time when we get to sacred texts, but the Kojiki is um, a major sacred text of Shintoism. Um, <clears throat> it's said in the Kojiki that there's a potentially infinite number of kami. They can be vaguely thought of as spirits of things and not just of people or gods. In addition uh, to being spirits of people or gods, like, you know, say I could have a kami if I died and then I, you know, my soul was released from my body. Um, but aside from people or gods, they also say they're a kami of geographical features like mountains, rivers, or waterfalls. There could be a ghost or spirit of the mountain, a ghost or spirit of the waterfall or river, you know. There's also kami of groups rather than individuals. So it's not just that the individual soul can have a kami, but even a clan, a family, a village, or a neighborhood can have its own spirit. Um, there's even talk of kami of time periods or generations. So there's a ghost of the Gen Z or a ghost of the millennials or, you know, the boomers, whatever. Um, a kami, a spirit being, an essence that represents or stands for that. Sometimes there's a kami of natural forces that are in that are somehow imbued with a divine essence. Like you may have heard the word kamikaze before and we've often thought about it in terms of a military tactic where people are willing to sacrifice their lives by like, you know, crashing planes uh, into military targets. But the original meaning of it um, is divine wind. <clears throat> so just a reference to the term from its original Shinto origin. Okay, so kami, spirits, uh, spirit, ghost, soul, um, kazi has to do with wind. So a divine wind is kamikaze, and the origin of that term is from a typhoon that saved Japan from the invasion of the Mongols in the 17th, uh, sorry, in the 13th century. So because of this wind that they thought was divine in its benevolence, protecting Japan, um, you know, there was this uh, term instituted of kamikaze. 
divine wind. Some kami are bad demons that are out looking for vengeance. And there's a term also for those, which is oni. <clears throat> so the demonic or malevolent spirits are the oni, another subcategory of kami. Um, still other kami are appropriated from Buddhist and Taoist deities. Among the most important of all kami are the ancestral spirits, um, the spirits of your ancestors and your deceased relatives going back in the past. The tradition holds that after death, a person's soul becomes a kami, just like as in, um, uh, you know, in other traditions, when you pass on and your soul escapes the body. Um, as in the Chinese traditions, the kami of your ancestors is honored in the household and household shrines where you pay your respects and honors to your deceased relatives. Kami of deceased leaders and soldiers are sometimes often highly revered. There are shrines sometimes dedicated and built just to them. Um, the most well-known kami in the tradition are the gods and goddesses from what the Shinto texts call the Age of the Gods. Okay, so here we got to learn a little bit about some lore, Age of the Gods. So the age of the gods can sort of be thought of as like a mythical origin story, not just of uh, Japan, but of the world. Um, so there are um, there are these gods from that time period in these mythical stories. The Shinto religion calls them um, heavenly kami and earthly kami. So there's two sets of them, a matsu kami. And then we have the earthly kami, which are kunitsu kami. Okay, so in the age of the gods, we learn of both types. We learn of the amatsu kami, heavenly, kunitsu kami, earthly. Um, in the stories of the classic Shinto scriptures, there's a description of a primitive era when these deities lived on earth before they established human rulers and emperors. So according to these origin stories, if you go way, way back into the ancient past, the earliest time of you know, the universe, you'd find um, that there were deities living on earth at that time, uh, and there were not yet human beings ruling or running the earth. So these deities lived on earth before they established the human world and society. And then after they did that, they retreat back to heaven and leave the earth. The book says that in the beginning, the world was formless and chaotic, uh, just kind of this like vague, um, amorphous mass of things and events with no structure or shape. Um, and during this time, seven generations of invisible kami arose. In the eighth generation, according to these stories, the god Izanagi and the goddess Izanami emerge and stand on a rainbow. Um, so these are two important earliest um, heavenly kami that are mentioned. So we've got Izanagi and Izanami. Um, yeah, so Izanagi is the male god and Izanami is the goddess. Okay, so I'm just telling you the sort of origin story of, um, of this Shinto account of Genesis and creation. So again, in the beginning, formless, chaotic world, seven generations of invisible kami grow from that. In the eighth generation, we see some important new deity figures emerge, Izanagi, the god, Izanami, the goddess. They emerge, they're standing on a rainbow, which is kind of described somewhat vaguely as a bridge to heaven, but they're standing up on that, and they dip a spear that is all bedazzled with jewels into this jellyish mass, which the world was at that time. And by dipping that spear into this mass, it creates the first land, an island called Onogoro. 
So. Okay, Onogoro is that land created by this act of dipping the spear into the jellyish unformed mass of the world. Um, they descend down to that island, and the story says that they then become aware of their genders, which causes them to reproduce. They conceive a child, and the first child uh, is a monster. You know, So Izanami has this monstrous child, but then after that, uh, the next subsequent ones become islands of the Japanese archipelago. So it's like literally through the act of conception and reproduction by this god and goddess, the child that is uh, the result are the Japanese lands uh, that later form the country. This is the Shinto cosmology and origin story of Japan and of the world. Now, Izanami has other children, and they say in the story that her last child is a god of fire, and he causes her to be burned through the delivery of him. It burns her, it kills her, and that sends her down into the land of the dead, which is called Yomi. So... Okay, so if you're following the little narration, Izanagi, Izanami, they cause the world to exist. They come down onto the land created by that act, procreate, have children. First one's um, kind of a monster, but then there's a whole bunch after that that are the uh, basis for the lands themselves and the islands that form Japan. Um, Finally, young, uh, sorry, Izanami has this uh, eighth child who's a fire god, um, or I should say last child. I'm not sure about the number, so let's go with last child. The last child's a fire god. It burns her to death. Then that sends her down to the land of the dead, the Yomi. Now, Izanagi knows this has happened, and he wants to go and retrieve you know, um, his goddess. So he goes down into Yomi trying to find her, but instead he sees that she's been turned into like a hideous demon. Uh, and she's decayed, so he's freaked out, and he, he tries to escape, and he barely escapes with his life. When he gets back, they say that he purifies himself from all the filth of the underworld by bathing in this river that's uh, in northern Japan. And while he's bathing, uh, the sun goddess Am Amaterasu is born from his left eye. So, again... <clears throat> Sun goddess, this is the story of her genesis, that she's born from the eye of the bathing Izanagi after he returns from the underworld. Um, from his left eye, she comes. From his right eye, uh, it's the moon god that is born, Sukoyomi. Okay, so that's the birth and origin story of the, the moon god, comes from the right eye of the bathing Izanagi. And from his uh, nose, it's the sun, uh, the storm god, Susano. And um, yeah, so storm god born from the nose, moon god, right eye, sun god, left eye. Izanagi, after this bathing and um, creation session, if you will, retires to Kyushu Island, where there are still some shrines to him and Izanami. Uh, but before retiring, he sets up power for his children. He names Amaterasu the supreme deity. This goddess of sun becomes the supreme deity in Shinto. Sukayomi becomes the god of night, uh, kind of changed the designation slightly from moon god to night god. And Susano becomes the god of the sea. Again, a slight adjustment from the original designation of storm god. Now, later, as the story continues, Susano, the you know um, storm slash um, uh, what do we say? Yeah, so the storm god uh, Susano later becomes jealous of his sister Amaterasu, and he gets in a rage in heaven. Um, that causes disorder and chaos in heaven. So. The sun goddess, Amaterasu, is scared of him. She responds by hiding in a heavenly cave of darkness. But that causes other problems because she's the sun god, and once she hides, it brings about darkness in the world, depriving it of light and hurting the production of crops. 
some scholars believe that the um, essential elements of the story were somehow originally caused by an eclipse that must have happened in Japan a long time ago, making the people at the time wonder where had the sun gone. Uh, so this account was written to you know, justify the, the events that were witnessed. But anyway, she retreats to the heavenly cave of darkness. It deprives the world of sun and light. Eventually, she's lured out by others, and uh, she, the sun comes back because she's lured out of the cave. Um, the sun returns. After that, Susanna was banished from the heavenly realm, and she has unchallenged rule as the true you know, supreme deity of Shinto. Um, according to legend, she has a descendant generations later who is a human being, Jimmu, and he becomes the first human emperor. And that, with that, the age of the gods ends because it was a handoff to the earthly imperial line. So Jimmu. Okay, Jimmu, mythical first human emperor, descendant of Amaterasu. Um, that's the Shinto mythology, and that tries to give a uh, a connection between the imperial authority in the actual world and the divine authority that is supposed to be the origins at, at which um, the whole cosmos starts. Let me give you a little epilogue to this story, which is interesting, written on page 246 of the book. So it says there, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, Iz the Izumu region of Japan made an important contribution to the Shinto myth in particular, the story of the establishment of the rule of Jimmu, the first emperor in the Japanese imperial line. After Susanoo's banishment from heaven, he descended to the earth, where he saved a beautiful maiden from a dragon. Susanoo found a fabulous sword, Kusanagi, in one of its eight tails, and gave it to his sister, the goddess Amaterasu, as a peace offering. He's now trying to make, make up with her. Um, he married the maiden, built a palace near Uzumu, and fathered a dynasty of powerful deities who came to rule the earth. The greatest was uh, Okuninushi, the great lord of the country. Alarmed at Okuninushi's power, Amaterasu sent her grandson Honenigi to reestablish her sovereignty over the earth. A compromise was reached. Beginning with Honenigi's descendant Jimmu, the earthly scions of Amaterasu would rule the earth as emperors, while Okuninushi would be the perpetual divine guardian of the land. Okay, so. Just a little bit more context as to how there's this story given of a human emperor being the result of um, divine forces that, that are their progenitors. So that's the epilogue of Susano's banishment. It's a story of Okuninushi, the guardian god of Japan. And that's also considered the second most venerated kami after Amaterasu. So I'm just going to give this name really quick. Okuninushi. <clears throat> God of Japan, second most uh, honored and uh, worshipped kami after the sun, this sun goddess. Other notable kami are Inari, the rice god, that's referred to on page 246 of our book. Um, very briefly from the text. Um, <clears throat> other major kami include Inari, the rice god, widely venerated as the deity who ensures an abundant rice harvest and by extension, general prosperity. His cult is especially important to shopkeepers, merchants, and artists. Um, his messenger and guardian is the fox, and images of the fox are prominent at all the gods' shrines. In ancient times, he was also considered to be a patron of swordsmiths. Um, there's also the seven uh, luck, lucky gods, which include um, Daikokuten, Aiko Kuten and his son Ibisu. And uh, what they both sort of stand for and represent is wealth and abundance. Um, so there's seven total of these uh, seven lucky gods. 
Yeah, so. Just in other prominent kami as we're going over, um, you know, aspects of the divine in Shinto. So you've got the seven lucky gods. I guess I listed two of them above the heading there, but Daiku, uh, Daiku Kuten and Ibisu are two of them. There's also five more. So Benton is god of music and art, spirit of music and art, skillful production of music and art. Um, there's also uh, Fukuro Kuju. And um, his role is a god of popularity. So these are all linked by the general heading of being lucky. So lucky in music and art, lucky in popularity, um, wealth and abundance. Furthermore, there's hotai, which is magnanimity. <clears throat> magnanimity is like being generous and good and knowing that you're great. And then um, jurojin, longevity. So kami of longevity, another thing that you're lucky if you can get. And then finally, um, Bishamantan, and that's the goddess of uh, prosperity. And you know, obviously some of these overlap a little bit. If you have prosperity, that might be in terms of wealth and abundance. Um, Sorry, did I say a prosperity? I, I, I really meant the wrong thing there. That's God of Benevolent Authority. I was, I was looking at a different part of my notes. Let me correct that if I may. Sorry, guys, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah sorry, my bad. Hmm. So yeah, caught my little little brain fart there, but yeah, Bishamantan is the god of benevolent authority, which means when you rule and preside over things, but you do so in a way that's generous, kind, and wise, instead of just being an authoritarian or being an oppressive force. So that's everything that I had for you guys today as we get our first big installment going of the Japanese religious traditions. We had a good uh, discussion of the introduction to the whole concept and topic, as well as the historical development and origins, and we've also now been able to lean into a little bit of the um, aspects of the divine and spiritual beliefs that constitute Shinto. When we come back next time, we'll pick up with the second half of the aspects of the divine by looking at the Buddhist um, doctrines and ideas that are found in Japanese practice and culture. And then we'll just move on to our other interesting topics like sacred times, sacred places, sacred persons, and all the rest. So I hope you guys stay tuned and stay with the class. Um, I really appreciate all your hard work so far this semester. Let's make sure that we don't slow down and continue to kind of sprint to the finish. Uh, but I really appreciate your time. So once again, have a good one. I'm signing this one off. I'll be in touch with you with the next installment in a few days. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye.